Good morning. This is Pastor Dennis Roser. Welcome to Divine Service at St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Our Sunday morning worship service is held every week at 9 o'clock a.m. And we invite you to join us and receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. Today's program is given to the glory of God by Ron and Lori Castle in celebration of their wedding yesterday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. St. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Together we confess our faith with the whole Church of Christ. 
through the Church's Confession, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning from Romans chapter 3 
is appointed to be read on Reformation Sunday each year because Luther had written in his Bible in the margin near Romans 3, verse 23. This is the central point and the central place of the epistle out of the whole Bible. And so because Luther deemed this passage to be the center of all that Scripture teaches, we read it on the day that we remember the reforming movement that Luther brought to the whole church in his days in the 1500s. And as we read this passage, which clearly teaches that we cannot do anything to make ourselves worthy of God's love, but that in fact, God has done this on our behalf, as we shall explore later. It is easy to see why people in Luther's day just soaked up this message. Why they gravitated to it in such numbers. Because they lived in a time in which almost everyone was concerned about their relationship with God. Almost everyone was concerned about where they would spend eternity. And they also lived in a church context in which demands were made on people in the name of earning God's favor, of making oneself worthy of God's love. At the end of the day, this whole structure that existed in the church in the medieval period, special offerings that you would have to make, special pilgrimage that's that you would have to take, needing to buy pieces of paper that said forgiveness had been granted to you or to a loved one, because there was a concern in those days of a man-made teaching called purgatory, which is it's just a fiction, so we're not gonna, even going to go into that. But essentially the idea is that there is a place between earth and heaven and people are stopped there and have to perform various satisfactions in order to be released from there and go to heaven. As I say, it's a fiction. We're not going to go into its history or spend any time on it other than to mention it. But they believe this. They believe that their dear mother or father or a child were there. And so they would go and they would buy these pieces of paper called indulgences, which was what Luther was railing against. And they would do all kinds of sacrificial acts in order to earn God's love. So you can imagine how exciting and how radical it was for Luther to teach from this passage that you cannot, by anything that you do, make yourself worthy of God's love but that in fact, God's love for you is such that he gave his son, Jesus, to die in your place, answer for your sins, so that everyone who believes in him, they have forgiveness, and with it, eternal life. It was almost too good to be true in the minds of so many people which is why Luther needed to teach so frequently about it. Unfortunately, culture has changed so much between medieval Germany and 21st century United States. This passage and what it teaches remains the center of all that the Bible teaches. It is indeed the center of Scripture, the central point but it's so much more difficult to teach today. We don't have masses of people crowding around to hear about this, becoming excited. First and foremost, when we read this passage from Romans 3, people's eyes begin to glaze over. I don't blame anyone who reads this passage, this paragraph, as important as it is, 
and concludes at the end of it, I don't understand a single thing that I read. Because the language and the argumentation that Paul uses here is very, very difficult. Which is why we're going to take a little time to go into it. But the other thing that stands in the way as a barrier between what this passage teaches and the people we hope to reach is that many of the people, perhaps the majority of the people that we hope to reach today have very little concept of God and less of the gospel itself, the good news that Jesus has died in their place and answered for their sins. Unfortunately, if they know anything about Christianity, unfortunately what they know is that there are Christians in America who are extremely political, excessively judgmental, and their lives do not reflect the love and the grace that so marked that of the Savior whom they purport to represent. And so it is an uphill battle as we seek to reach the lost in our day. Because very few of them have any sense that they have sin that they need to worry about. Very few of them at a conscious level are thinking about their relationship with God and wishing that they had a deeper, more fulfilling relationship with God. That is not on the minds of people in our society. And we can complain all we want. We can grumble that it's so much harder. And we can complain about these people, how they're so difficult to reach, and the things that they think is so wrong. And the culture's all screwed up. But at the end of the day, that is not why Christ instituted, founded the church. He founded the church to reach the lost, that they might be saved. And so our context is what it is. It's always been difficult. It's just that every time it seems that we get a handle on how to do it, it changes because culture changes. But make no mistake, people today have just as much need for God as they ever did. And what's more, they continue to have a craving for God as they always have. They just don't know what they are craving. Blaise Pascal, very famous mathematician, physicist, inventor from the 1600s in France, also a Catholic theologian, who is credited with being the founder of the computer because he created a mechanical calculating machine. One of the early computer languages was named Pascal in his honor. Blaise Pascal said that everyone, no matter who they are and what they believe, has within their hearts an infinite abyss an abyss is simply a bottomless space. It's an openness that has no boundaries. And he says inside, everyone has this. And because an infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite God, until they find him, until he begins to take possession of their heart and mind, they will crave and they will seek to fill it with everything else. Look at our society, look at our culture, look at the people around you, and look at all the substitutes for God that they are seeking after. Sometimes it's an excessive devotion to career advancement. Other times it's various forms of addiction, whether it's drugs, unhealthy, understandings and practices of sexuality. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's the involvement that we have in our children's lives 
There are many parents who live their lives through their children. We all know horror stories of someone who forced their kids to be in sports because they were never really good at sports and they were trying to live out that elusive glory through their children. And many times what we see is they destroy their children's lives because of all their hopes and dreams reside in their children's successes and accomplishments. When the children stumble, and they will because we're human, it is almost unbearable for those parents. And so they push them harder, and the demands become harder and higher, and unreasonably expectant. We see that craving lived out in our culture all over the place. We speak of materialism, how just having a smartphone is not enough. We gotta get the latest one that came out this year because this one, this one has some new feature that the old ones never had or cars, we gotta get a new car because now this car talks to you or it can tell you your tire pressure from the inside or we go to the mall and we look around and we say, I don't have a red sweater, I gotta have a red sweater. It's to fulfill a craving that is within us. And so we don't have an atheistic culture. Everyone has a God, everyone worships but not everyone worships the one true God. And so they continue to strive, they continue to crave, they continue to chase after things that do not satisfy. If you've ever saw a purchase that you believed would bring you fulfillment and meaning and have known the dissatisfaction that comes with having it, and not being fulfilled. You know what they're going through. And so this passage from Romans 3, which is, as I say, very complicated, very densely packed, and the language is difficult, speaks into their lives too. The challenge for the church is to learn how to share it. And it begins, of course, by teaching them about what they crave talking about our materialism, talking about the dissatisfaction that we have, the meaninglessness that we experience, and talking about who it is we're really craving. Paul begins by saying, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And you say to yourself, what on the earth is he even talking about? Righteousness, righteousness means that qualification that makes you worthy of your part in a relationship. Righteousness is not simply between God and us, although that's the context in which we normally speak of it because no one speaks of righteousness outside of a religious context. But in every relationship, there are expectations if that relationship is to be healthy. Relationship implies some mutuality, a two-way street, if you will, responsibilities that we each have. And so righteousness in a religious context is simply the expectations that exist for God's part of the relationship and our part of the relationship. Until Christ, until his death upon the cross, it was well understood that you earn God's favor by fulfilling His commands and demands. But no one can do that because we are sinners. And so that we are lost. Apart from Christ, we are lost. We cannot meet God's expectations. Paul says, but now, since Christ's death, but now, a new declaration of your worth before God has been made. It's made known. That's all manifestation means. Manifest. I really wish they would have translated that different. Give me a break. 
But it's apart from the law, apart from what you're doing. And now he's going to teach us that it's the gospel. He says, now, make no mistake, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. The law and the prophets, they bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What he's saying here is that everyone who believes, whether they're perfect or not, because some people think that they are perfect, there are those who tell me, I don't need to go to church because I live a good life and I believe in God. You see where their trust is? Do you see who their God is? Do you see whom they worship? That's right, themselves. They worship themselves. When we realize that we cannot merit God's favor by what we do. When we despair of our capacity for doing this, it fills us with grief. It terrorizes the conscience. And that is where the gospel meets us. The good news of Jesus Christ speaks into that terror, speaks into that despair, because there are actually many people who in fact once believed, once had been a part of the church, and for whatever reason, a multitude of reasons, have fallen away, and who really believe they have cut themselves off from God forever. Where is their understanding of God? It's in their own ability to make themselves right. And they believe they have failed and all is lost. Our job as gospel bearers is to teach them, to carry the precious message that your relationship with God does not depend upon you. It depends upon Christ Jesus, who died in your place, answered for your sins. And so that all, who believe this news, they have been made right with God. They have been made worthy of His love. Paul says, and we are justified by His grace as a gift. Again, another word we don't use a whole lot. The only time we speak of justify is when some it's one is justifying their actions. They are making excuses for themselves. They are explaining to us how what they did was right and it was the only thing they could have done given the circumstances. That understanding is not far off. It's not far off. Because in declaring us right with himself, God is justifying our existence. He is justifying our purpose, our reason for being. All of the things through which people justify themselves, their career. Think of all the things that people feel compelled to tell anybody who will listen at a high school reunion. I don't actually know this from first person experience because in over 27, 28 years, to my knowledge, we've never had a reunion. I say to my knowledge because they may have had them, uh, but they didn't invite me. I don't know. But people need to talk about how successful they are. And you know, we, we, have, the, we have the yacht and, and, our, and our children, our children are, are they're beautiful and they're successful and, and they're wonderful. And all these things, the list goes on. What are they doing? Trying to justify their reason for being. Again, it's about craving. It's about filling a void within that can only be filled with God. And so we think if we pile enough of things in there, it will fill that void. But it's empty. The person at the reunion boasting of all these things inside knows that none of this brings them fulfillment. 
Paul teaches us that Christ has declared us righteous. The Heavenly Father has made us right with Himself because what if Jesus has done? There is no better good news than that message. Because try as we might, no matter how careful we are, no matter how morally inclined we may be, we can never earn God's favor. Even the one, even the one who declares, I live a good life, God sees that I'm trying, has that gnawing feeling inside, knowing that things are not right. The Christian has the joy and the privilege to declare that God, the most gracious and heavenly Father, has fixed our relationship with himself. And it's for all people. St. Paul says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, but all who believe this are made right with him. It is a universal message for all who will believe it. And it is good news. May that good news speak into your lives. May it satisfy those cravings that would seek after other things and rob you of your peace, your contentment, your joy. May this good news so transform you that the burdens that you feel begin to slip away. And that suddenly, suddenly you feel free, truly free. May that freedom spill over into a joy and a desire to share that news with everyone else around you who continues to bear the weight of those burdens. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today, and may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by His gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever.